I hope you saw that if the variance of treatments in the population is very large and we're taking a sample estimate of it, then the ratio of our variance to treatments to variance of errors should be actually, on average, larger than 1. And so, our F statistic will be able to capture this difference between what we expect by chance and what we actually observed. Let's look at this a little bit more formally. The variance of treatments, that is, the numerator of our test statistic here, is actually capturing two things. Whatever systematic variance there is in the population, plus the random variability that we're always likely to get. And we're going to be dividing that simply by random variances. So if H1 is true, that is, not all the toss of Js are actually zero, then that numerator quantity is capturing something in addition to random variability. And notice why that has to be the case. If there actually is some difference between those taws and the population, then the variance in the numerator will tend to be very large. A variance is different from zero when we actually have observations that are differing from their mean. And we formed the treatment offsets in both the population and the sample model as offsets from the grand mean. So to the degree that there are larger mean differences, larger differences between individual means and their grand mean, then that numerator quantity will get larger and larger. So we'll tend to get values of f that are larger than 1. Notice that if HO is true, that is, if there really is no treatment effects, so all the toss of j's in the population are 0, all we're actually measuring is random variance divided by random variance. And that will form the fischer snedeker distribution with as many degrees of freedom in the numerator and denominator as we actually have. So if the null hypothesis is true, we know what values of f we should expect to get. And to the degree that we get a value of f that is much different from what we expected under the null hypothesis, we'll be able to reject the null hypothesis, just like we've done for all of our other test statistics. So from our f test, from our analysis of variance, we're also going to get a p-value. How unlikely would the f ratio we found be if the null hypothesis is true? And notice the null hypothesis being true here is simply that the variance of the taws in the population is zero, that there really isn't systematic variance in the numerator of our test statistic. So we're going to form the f as the variance of treatments over the variance of error. In the last module, we even looked at the variance for error. We called it a mean square for error. And so keeping with that notation, we're going to call the variance of treatments the mean square of treatments. And now remember, a mean square is simply a sums of squares divided by its degrees of freedom. So we immediately have a way to calculate this. We simply need to know how to find the sums of squares for treatment, and we need to know what the degrees of freedom for treatment are. The mean square for error, like we saw before, is simply the sums of squares for error divided by the degrees of freedom for error. Remember, the sums of squares for error was simply the deviations between the actual scores for individuals, the yij's, minus the predicted scores squared. And remember, the double summation notation there was simply saying, do this for every observation we have in every group. So for all the i's in all the j's. Remember, this is just how much individuals spread out around their own group means. That will be our baseline for error. That's one of the variances we're trying to estimate, the mean square for error. So the sums of squares for error captures those deviations. We'll see in an analysis of variance model, we'll also call these the sums of squares within. Now the within here is referring to within a group. This is the amount of error, or the amount of deviations, that are simply among individuals within their own group. So that is the denominator of our analysis of variance, the mean square for error, the sums of squares for error divided by the degrees of freedom. So what about the mean square for treatment? Well, that's again the sums of squares for treatment, which is going to be some deviations among those taws, or in our sample model, among the t's, divided by the degrees of freedom. Let's look at the sums of squares for treatment first, and then we'll tackle the degrees of freedom. Well, the sums of squares for treatment, just like we form for any sums of squares, are deviations. In this case, the sums of squares for treatment is the sum of the square distances for each individual's predicted score from the grand mean. Now, we'll talk about why it gets formed in this way, but notice what this is really saying. The sum for each individual of the predicted score, which remember is just their group mean, minus the grand mean. 
Now, in an analysis of variance model, we also call these sums of squares the sums of squares between. In essence, these are the sums of squares between groups versus the sums of squares within a group.